Hi everyone, it's uh, great to have you here and for some of us this is the first time to be doing a launch event via uh, in the virtual space so if there are any glitches just bear with us. It is a very exciting day for healthcare in South Africa mm -hmm. because South Africans now have access to a whole new range of testing and data and information that will help them make personalized health and nutrition choices. Um, I think this has been a long time coming. It's uh, very big um, in the United States and across Europe. So very exciting now that's uh, very exciting that South Africans can now um, access this. Today's webinar is going to be quite short and compact. Um, we respect your time and we know that you have a lot of distractions and dependence, whether they have two legs or four, um, we know that everybody's attention is far more precious um, than normal. So we, we really respect your time and for us it's really special to have such a high caliber of journalists and influencers and just all of you in the audience today. We appreciate that so much. Today's launch will really have three sections. Um, I will introduce each of the three speakers, after which there will be questions and answers um, at the end. So please, if you have any thoughts or, or questions that you'd like answered throughout any of the presentations, please just make a note of them or remember what they are, because at the very end, all of the panelists um, will be available um, to answer those questions for you. And um, there's going to be a lot of exciting information presented. If you um, are someone that has done the test and you've received your test results already, um, it will be explained to you how to read those. So getting started, our first um, speaker for today is Dr. Yvonne Holt. She is the Chief Medical Officer at Next Biosciences. She studied medicine at WITS. She also did a diploma in child healthcare diploma and, and a diploma in transfusion medicine. Um, She's also worked in pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, and she um, has numerous qualifications um, behind her name that make her an absolute expert in this field. Where she is right now as Chief Medical Officer at Next Biosciences, she's responsible for all the medical development and laboratory management of all new, si new services um, at Next. So she will give you a quick introduction to what the microbiome is, why it's important, um, and why Next Biosciences decided to bring this test um, into South Africa. So over to you, Dr. Yvonne. Thank you very much, and um, uh, welcome to everyone. This is quite exciting to be doing this um, webinar, although I think we all would have liked to have a lovely lunch at the Restless. Perhaps we can be together after the lockdown. So, I will just um, introduce Next Biosciences to you um, as a company and then why we, we chose to add uh, the bio tests to our menu of um, services. So, start with Next Bioscience is a South African biotech company. And our aim really is to combine medicine, science, and technology to create innovative products and services for people. And this is an ability to allow them to really invest in and take personal ownership of their future health. We, oops. So, as a um, biotech leader in South Africa, we first started out in 2005, we were initially part of the Medicare group, and um, in 2008 um, we became independent, so we service all healthcare groups um, in South Africa now. Our headquarters are in Johannesburg in Midland, uh, where we have our laboratory. And um, the company is essentially uh, female-led, that is, that is our claim to fame, and we have about uh, 50 employees. Our main focus is on the preconception and post-birth market. As um, a, a market leader, we are the 
largest stem cell bank um, on the African continent and a market leader in reproductive genetics. We do a lot of um, genetic testing in the reproductive space. We also are the only producer of um, biological products from the placenta. And I'll go into all of those um, in my next slide, where um, I'll introduce our Good companies. Our first company was, um, was Netcell, and Netcell started off as a umbilical cold blood stem cell bank. We process and store stem cells from the umbilical cord of newborn babies. That um, division has grown to also processing um, and extracting stem cells from adipose fat tissue from adults, and we're currently involved in a few clinical trials using those stem cells um, in different therapies. Then we have our Next Genetics, which is our reproductive um, genetics company. We do genetic testing uh, mostly in the reproductive space, um, offering um, carrier screening, so testing couples um, for hereditary diseases that they can um, unborn children. We also do test, uh, genetic testing of embryos as well as genetic testing in pregnant women to check if their unborn children have any chromosomal abnormalities. Then our third um, company is Placelta and Placelta engineers regenerative biological products from the placenta. Um, currently we are making biological dressings from the amniotic membrane of the placenta that are used extensively in eye surgery as well as wound care. So all your diabetic and venous ulcers, the, um, these biological dressings can help heal those. And then lastly, we have our Hexa Labs, which offers um, a number of health and lifestyle tests in the functional needs space, and the microbiome testing offers under this company. This is just a, an overview of our leadership team. Um, Kim Hewlett is the founder of the company and our chief executive officer and the genius behind um, our existence. And um, we also have Professor Carolyn Minsler, who is a, um, a professor, a science professor at uh, UKZN. And um, Karina Yufitu, our financial officer, Catherine Holmes, our chief communications officer, and Roxanne Van Rab, our legal eagle, um, all form part of um, our very um, dynamic um, leadership team. So, to move on as to why um, we have gotten involved or our interest in microbiome testing is that. As we said, our aim is to offer um, innovative uh, products and services, and we strongly believe in um, the modernization of the medical paradigm where personalized medicine comes to the fore. Even in 1822, the great Sir William Osler said, if it were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might as well be a science and not an art. And it is true, medicine really is an art, and I think it's been made into more of a science in, say, the last hundred years with the advent of many drugs and treatments, which have certainly helped the human race in dealing with disease. However, as um, we have seen the scales are tipping now, and whereas before we, we had one treatment that um, fits all, and we've seen that that doesn't necessarily work because we are such varied individuals. And the future of medicine is more about personalized, personalized diagnostics. So it's going to look at the person's um, genetics and their response um, to treatments and their response to different diseases um, that, is, that is important. 
And therefore, um, we, we really do have to look at the person in themselves. And with um, the advent of, of genetics in, in the last 10, 15 years, we are beginning to understand um, the individual human condition much better. And certainly, the microbiome falls into that arena. And with the research that has gone on, we have discovered that, in fact, we are more bacteria than human. And the microbiome um, in adults can harbor about 100 trillion bacteria in the gut alone which is about 10 times the number of human cells that we possess. Now, um, understanding, with the understanding of our human genome, we, we know that we have about 23,000 genes in our bodies. The microbiome can contribute up to 3.3 million genes, so that is a whole bunch more information, in fact, 150 times larger than the human genome. So, the microbiome is important because these microorganisms perform a wide variety of metabolic functions that really do have a profound effect on human physiology with direct links to health and disease states. So, if there is gut dysbiosis, this has been shown to lead to cardiovascular disorders, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and autoimmune diseases. There's a very strong evidence, and there is some very strong evidence, that um, there exists a gut brain axis um, that has been shown to modulate the development of neurodegenerative diseases. So, with all of this evidence, there is increasing scientific investigation into the gut microbiome's role in health and disease in the individual. And there are many factors that obviously affect our gut microbiome that are also studied to see how all of this impacts our human ge genome which can tilt the scales between health and disease. So we are very dependent on and we have evolved um, we have evolved with our microbiome over thousands of years and really depend on the biochemical output of the microbiome, such as vitamins and short-chain fatty acids. But the microbiome, the gut microbiome, can also produce harmful biochemicals, and it is important that we understand the functions and identify and quantify these uh, biochemical, um, biochemicals and understand how they impact on our health. And as such, biome is a test that can give us this information, and that is why we have decided to add it to our menu of tests, so that we really can offer people um, new, innovative, and informative um, test results to help them on their health journey. So that is all for me. Um, again, thank you for all being here. You are most welcome to contact me anytime. Here is my email address um, should you have any questions. So thanks very much and over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Yvonne. I know that some of you we're struggling to hear Yvonne, um, and thank you for bearing with us. Yvonne had surgery um, on her leg this weekend, so she's in a moon boot and she's out on the farm, um, and obviously her mobility is, is a little bit restricted during this time. So for those of you that couldn't hear her, thank you for bearing with us. We um, I'm going to try to get that information and email it to all of you in case you missed Can can you hear me? Uh, yes, Stephen, we can hear you. Okay. Can 
different cities further away from each other than they are from us, um, but wonderful to have you uh, with us, Stephen and Rob. Um, I will now hand over to you two. Great. Well, thanks to the magic of um, the internet, which most of us really don't understand, I guess. Um, I'm 10,200 and some odd miles away um, from you all in South Africa. I'm in Seattle, Washington. Um, and it's my pleasure to, to join you and share a little bit um, more about the microbiome. And then uh, Rob will then uh, talk about uh, the actual uh, application and results. And I think I'll walk you through a, an example. So I just want to quickly emphasize something that, um, that Dr. Holt uh, started to talk about. And, and this statement um, is just a real powerful statement. I think explains why um, why Viome exists and why uh, NextBio is working with us and to help people in, uh, in South Africa. And it's the simple statement. The composition of the microbiome and all of its activities are involved in most and probably all of the biological processes in the human being that constitutes our health and disease. So everything about the human body in terms of, of how we function, how we age, what chronic diseases we get, what chronic diseases we don't get, all relate back to the composition and the activity of the microbiome. And there's no other single thing in our universe that has that profound effect on everything um, about our lives. And I've been involved in the microbiome field over 30 years and, and I've seen it evolve into ways that I could never even have dreamed and imagined um, 30 years ago and 20 years ago. And I think this simple chart, again, kind of puts it all together, why we're interested in the microbiome, why it's important to pay attention to it, and why there is so much research happening around the world in the microbiome. So we look at inflammatory diseases, cancer, metabolic diseases, liver diseases, GI diseases, neurological diseases, all have a foundation in this imbalance of the microbiome. If we talk about Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, we now know that it starts from what chemicals the microbiome is producing and which ones cross the blood-brain barrier. We understand what's happening with cancer, both in terms of cause of cancer, even breast cancer, for example, or how various cancer chemotherapy drugs um, react to the microbiome. So, for example, you can be taking an immunotherapy drug, and it's not very effective in 30 or 40 percent of the people it's given to. We have found out that that's because their microbiome is different. And if you adjust the microbiome, that immunotherapy cancer drug becomes more effective. We even know that the microbiome affects the effectiveness of a drug. For example, um, L-DOPA, which is given for Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, it's only effective in maybe 60% of the, of the population. The reason it turns out is the other 40%, their microbiome actually deactivates. It eats up the L-DOPA and feeds on it, so it never gets into the body. So, of course, drug companies are now working on how do we modulate the microbiome so a drug is more effective and two, has less side effects. By looking at the microbiome, we can tell signatures of which, which people can a drug would be effective on or some treatment would be effective on. So these are all incredible um, new arenas of healthcare that are now emerging um, uh, and will be a big part of our healthcare in the next, next several years. So why Viome? Um, uh, and I think the key of this is to understand that it's not the gene that matters in our health, it's the gene expression. The truth is there are very few you know, genetic diseases. They're very, very, very rare. It's how the gene interacts with the environment, what it produces and how the environment affects that, which is where health and disease is regulated. So gene expression is what drives Viome and allows us to understand the molecular behavior and what's being produced by those trillions and trillions of microbiome, bacteria, viruses, phages, parasites, fungi, um, that Dr. Holt mentioned. It enables us to identify the cause of a disease, okay, and allows us to make health benefits, um, wellness benefits, recommendations, which uh, Rob uh, will talk about in a minute. So it's this activity that matters. It doesn't matter necessarily who's there and who's not there, because they actually change what they do depending on their ecosystem. 
So a particular strain of bacteria might produce this particular metabolite one day, but the next day, if it's around other kinds of bacteria, produces a different kind of metabolite or doesn't produce the metabolite at all. So we have to understand not only who's there, but more importantly, what they are doing. And that's the difference in viome. And just, just quickly, there are three ways to look at what's happening um, inside your GI tract or your oral tract for the matter or on your skin. Um, and you can look at just who's there. That's called 16S sequencing. You can look at um, a little bit more in terms of not just bacteria, but also viruses um, and parasites and fungi. If you use metagenomic analysis, and some companies do that in, around the world. But Viome is the only company commercially uh, authorized by the by CLIA, by the US government, to do clinical testing for metatranscriptomic meta sequencing. And that's where we sequence the RNA, which allows us to know everything that's happening with who is there. That is how we are able to take that through translational science, understand what's happening, then through bioinformatics, and attach that to the things that help uh, an individual understand what they can do in terms of the foods they eat or don't eat, and what supplements they should take or should not take based on how we manipulate that microbiome. How do we change, increase pathways of gene expression that we want to increase? How do we decrease inflammatory pathways, for example, that we don't want to have happening through our gene expression in the microbiome? So that's, that's the, the key difference of, of Viome. And I know that's why NextBio um, contacted us and why we've been working together to now offer this to into South Africa. So now I'll, I'll turn it over to Rob, who can uh, explain more in terms of um, the application, how it relates to you. We have lots of laboratory work and scientists and computer power in the cloud working, but it really doesn't mean much until it, it gives you some useful information that you can use. So Rob? Oop. Thank you, Stephen. Sorry, I was sitting on mute there talking to myself. Uh, yes, so Stephen, everything you just described, the power and um, scope of this system that for years has basically been ignored in the world of health, uh, you know, now we have an ability to provide that information in a useful way at your fingertips uh, for individuals. And so, uh, what I'm going to do quickly is, is walk people through the app. Uh, I believe most of the people in the audience have done the test at this point. You've received your results uh, certainly by this morning. Uh, and so what I want to do is show you what you're looking at and then give you ways to think about this. And actually, Shelly's going to help me out a little bit here because uh, I think using an example of somebody who's gone through it, done the test uh, more than once and actually seen dramatic improvements in, in her scores and also how she feels I think is a good way to look at this. So I'm going to confirm that you guys can in fact see my screen here. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is when you get your results and you open up, oop, I'm going to, sh there we go. Now I believe you guys can see my screen. Okay, terrific. So when you guys get your results after doing the test and you open up your Viome app on your phone, this is going to be your home screen. And what it's showing is, is basically 50% of the information we provide. Because the way that I think about this is we provide two sets of information. Uh, your scores, which is what you'll see in a moment, uh, and then what can we do about those scores? And the scores are essentially all of the information that uh, we saw in the sample that you submitted, and then we are able to then convert that into an action step, something uh, tangible and doable that then you can improve those scores with, and that's the food recommendations. So what are we looking at here on this home screen? Uh, you have the ability to fast track to First, your superfoods, uh, which is that box in the top right. And your superfoods, we hear this term thrown around all the time that there are superfoods out there, garlic, avocados, what have you, that are uh, tremendous for everybody. And the reality is that's not really um, true. From person to person, it's much more nuanced than that. And so what this is showing you is for you specifically, these are your superfoods. And they'll be somewhere between... Uh, 10 and 25 for most people. 
Uh, on this home screen, you can see the opposite end of the spectrum, which is your foods to avoid or minimize. And I think one of the powerful things about this tool is we, we think that healthy foods are healthy for everybody, that everybody should eat spinach, that everybody should eat kale. And the reality is that's just not the case. Everybody has foods that are quote unquote healthy, and for you, they just are not great. Uh, and that can be for a number of factors. It can be because they will spike your blood sugar. It can be because you have a virus that that food is, is feeding on and creating inflammation. Or it can be that for your microbiome, this particular food uh, might be producing harmful byproducts that are creating inflammation. So for any of those reasons, there are healthy foods for everybody that, um, that they shouldn't be eating. And that's where you can, you can get to those foods. The other two boxes on this screen, uh, my supplements, very straightforward. Uh, for a lot of people, supplementation may be helpful based on what we see in the sample and based on some of the feedback from the questionnaire that you complete for the test. And for most people, uh, they will get somewhere between one and four supplement recommendations. There'll be an explanation there as to why that supplement was recommended. Um, some people do in fact have no supplement recommendations. Uh, I do envy them. Uh, they don't need anything <laughs> according to this. Um, and then the final square is all my foods. And this I refer to as kind of the Google search engine for your particular diet. Meaning when you click on that, uh, you can see all of the foods and where they rank for you, meaning should are these superfoods? Should you be enjoying these foods or should you be minimizing or avoiding them? And there's actually a, a search bar at the top. And so you can literally search just about any food out there and it will tell you how often, to, how great is this food for you? How often should you eat it? What is the specific serving size for you? Tips on preparing that food to make it even uh, better for you. Uh, so all of that information is is then in the app, but this is again the home screen from which you can start to to uh, explore those. Uh, I mentioned that this is half of the information. The other half is how does your microbiome look uh, in terms of what we call the scores. So, and I'm I know I'm sure a lot of you guys are looking at this and thinking, what is putrescine oxalate metabolism pathways? I don't understand what any of this means. So let me start to break that down for you guys. We take in a tremendous amount of information from the sequencing process, and then we try to simplify that into 20 gut scores uh, and, and metrics that you can start to conceptualize how healthy is my microbiome. And for each of these scores, we started with simple smiley faces. Uh, is this score in a normal range for you? Are you? Does it look very good for you, or does it maybe need some improvement? And the benefit is when you click on one of these scores, it's gonna take you to a explanation of what the score means, a video of our chief translational science officer explaining the score and how to think about it in the context of your food recommendations. And it's going to show you within the general population, how did your particular score stack up against uh, that general population? So you really get a feel for what does this mean and, and specifically what does it mean for me? Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to bring up, because I think that instead of me explaining, here's some good tools for how to think about the app, uh, I'd actually include Shelly uh, Braden on this because she's done a number of tests with us. And, and specifically, we looked at a test that she did in 2018 in September, and then a, exactly one year later in September of 2019. And what was really exciting to look at is nine out of her 20 scores improved. And remember, not all of her scores needed improvement off the bat. So you know, let's say uh, almost all of her scores improved. Um, and so that's what a couple of these slides denote. But what I wanted to do is, Shelly, can you uh, speak a little bit in terms of how did you think, when you got your results the first time around, how did you think about the food recommendations and starting to implement some of those into your daily life? Because I know that it can be overwhelming with all the information we give you up front. Hi, Rob. Uh, yes, sure. So when I first got my recommendations, as you said, you know, you've got an exceptionally long list of foods um, and a lot of different scores, which you need to make your way through. 
So um, Rob actually gave me a very good tip, uh, which I found very useful in that you kind of do first things first. And the most important thing to do is to avoid your avoid foods. And that's exactly what I did. So I think I had a list of about 15 foods, uh, a lot of which I ate on a daily basis. So that was broccoli, banana, cabbage, um, and oranges as well. And so what I did was remove those from my diet and supplement them with something else. Uh, I also tried to then supplement it with a superfood, which is actually was was a lot easier than I thought because it's quite a simple change. Uh, yeah, so so that that is what I did. And I think uh, that is probably if you were to talk to a lot of our uh, science staff, that is the easiest uh, kind of gateway into this is to say, you know. Cutting out the avoid foods is, is a pretty straightforward step. Um, and then you, you, ne you don't necessarily need to implement every single food on the superfood list, but picking one or two of those kind of as you just described, Shelly, and starting to just eat those more. Or um, I spoke with somebody recently who looked at this and said, bananas are a superfood for me. Sorry, they're an avoid food for you, Shelly, but uh, they were a superfood for this person. And so they just started eating a banana on their way out the door in the morning. Uh, kale was a superfood, spinach was a minimized food, and so when they're at a salad bar, they get kale instead of spinach uh, for their salad. So little tweaks like that do make the difference, certainly over a, uh, if you have a longer horizon, um, which I think is the way to think about this. And what was exciting to me again, Shelly, is, is obviously a lot of your scores improved pretty dramatically, but the ultimate litmus test I always say is, is how do you feel? And I remember when we chatted and looked back at your questionnaire year over year, uh, a lot of your symptoms also improved. Uh, not everything, but a lot of them really improved uh, substantially. And, and so that's, that's the exciting uh, point or part for me. Um, Oh, and these, Shelly, were the only scores that uh, actually did not improve. And uh, as we chatted earlier, uh, oxalate metabolism pathway, bile acid metabolism pathway, these are probably less important scores, so to speak, relative to all the improvements that you did have. So um, so I appreciate you sharing that, Shelly. Uh, in terms of some common questions that we get that I'll, I'll just close with, we do have four sets of tiering for the food. So we have superfoods, which are, these are your, your force multipliers. These are the things that are tremendous for you uh, and will help move the system in a positive direction. Uh, you have your enjoy foods, which are the staples of your diet. Uh, you're going to have, most people will have a ton of these, which gives you plenty of options to choose from. Uh, you'll have your minimized foods. And this is where a lot of people have questions. What does minimize mean? And a better way to think of that is probably uh, your moderation foods. So these are not things to avoid entirely. If that was the case, they'd be on the avoid list. Um, these are things that provide some benefit in moderation for your specific microbiome. We just don't want to overwhelm the system with these foods. And so, you know, a couple times a week, uh, you can continue to enjoy them. Uh, and then obviously the avoid foods are pretty self-explanatory. Um, with that, uh, we can come back to, I know a lot, a number of the people in the audience have done the test. So if people have specific questions, we can certainly hit that at the end of this call. Uh, for now, the, the one thing I wanted to leave people with, and, and Stephen alluded to this, this is a profound technology. And when we licensed it back uh, in 2017, I think at the time, to do one of these tests would cost you $5,000. Uh, when we launched our first test, we launched uh, at a consumer price of 400 and today we're selling it at just over 100 uh, US dollars. And that to me is incredibly exciting because uh, it feels like a miracle of both science and engineering that we all get to enjoy now uh, and, and try to move our health in a better direction. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to the next bio team and thanks for having me guys.
Olympics. And then we heard speaking was Rob Pello, who explained how to read your reports and the different food groups, etc. He's the dedicated accounts manager for Viom in South Africa and will be taking care of the South African business. Um, he studied um, at the University of Del Delaware. And so while Stephen was um, in Florida, Rob was in Bellevue near Seattle. So the two of them quite far away from both of from each other and from us. And just thank you both for those very insightful explanations. And moving on to our last speaker for today, somebody who's back home here with us in South Africa. Um, who has a very interesting story to tell. The next speaker is Sarah Braithwaite. Now, Sarah is going to speak on her own personal experience with the microbiome because she has uh, previously suffered from an autoimmune disease. She runs a neuroscience-based business. She's a life and integrative health coach. She works on training, development, and workshops. She's also an inspirational um, speaker, and she founded and owns the business Mindsight. Um, She's also an active board member of Arthritis South Africa. She studied at Stellenbosch University. She studied at Wits University. She's also a certified business and life coach um, in the Neuro Leadership Group um, and a certified health coach. Um, so a very, very smart lady, as you can see. Um, and she was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, um, which she will speak to you more about when she was um, 15 years old. So she has a very interesting um, story to tell. Um, so let me not steal her thunder any further. Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, sorry, just hold on a second. Sorry, I just need to confirm something. Please give me a minute. Okay, can everybody see me in here? Yes. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Um, it's wonderful to be able to talk to you all today and to share my um, personal experience. For most of us, I think we take our health for granted until we have a scare. Um, prevention means is not humanity's strongest virtue, and we tend to try and get away with as little self-care as possible. For me, that scare happened when I was 15 years old and was faced with a diagnosis of a rare autoimmune disease. I had never heard of it and I could hardly pronounce it. Um, it was called scleroderma and is called scleroderma. Having been perfectly healthy my whole life, this came as a very sudden shock and would completely change the direction of my life in a new way, a journey that is almost impossible to put into 10 or 15 minutes. Sorry, I've just got something flashing on my screen. Can you bear with me for one second? There we go. 19 years later, and far more knowledgeable and wiser today, I'd like to share my medical path to wellness with you all and entail the mental, physical, and emotional twists and turns that have been there too. The medical landscape has changed so much since my diagnosis. Back then, when I was 15 years old, Sugar in any quantity was pretty much acceptable. Fluorescent juices were great. Tinned food and microwave meals were a hit for any household. And MSG and things like aromat were considered safe to eat. There was a little information around emotions and thoughts and that the way that they can change our gene expression and impact our physiology. There was a little neuroscientific evidence around stress and how it impacts the brain. And there was a little information around mindfulness, which is now scientifically validated to improve brain and body function. Much has changed now, but there still is room for lots more. Chronically fatigued with severe muscle depletion, painful joints, hard calcium depositions all over my body, lack of good blood circulation, and high inflammatory markers. I fought against the odds and made it through school and university actually quite functional and happy. But it was leading up and during my first corporate job in Johannesburg that things turned for the worst. I endured panic attacks, infected joints, and having to resign from work, ended up pretty much bedridden in 2015 or on crutches. Western meds had taken me so far 
and then I hit a wall. Six surgeries later, really great medical decisions and really terrible medical decisions, a decade of research, a complete change in my diet, better stress management, and literally the A to Z of everything from Western to alternative. And somehow I popped out the other end, which is now a greater sense of self and greater overall well-being and health than I could have ever imagined. Autoimmune diseases, cancer, diabetes, and other inflammatory-related diseases are definitely on the rise globally, and we've already touched on that today through the other speakers. And reasons are pointing towards poor nutrition, overload of toxicity through chemicals, heavy metals, preservatives, you name it, chronic stress, lack of movement, and emotional disconnect. And inflammation, according to medical authorities, is the underlying biggest cause of most diseases. Everything that we eat, how much we move, how we internalize stress, and our emotional regulation either feeds inflammation or acts as anti-inflammatory. And I learned this definitely the hard way. One of my biggest incredible realizations through scientific research was that up to 80% of our immune cells are based in our gut. So gut health really sets the tone for overall health, inflammation, mental health and immune control. The second startling thing I uncovered through research was that our entire ecosystem of microbiota alive within us and on us outweighs our own human DNA cell ratios 10 to 1. Although many bacteria are friendly, there are some very destructive ones that can cause inflammation and even affect our food choices and cravings. They can cause gut symptoms and attack our central nervous system and ultracellular functioning. An imbalance of too much bad bacteria called dysbiosis can cause havoc on overall health. The bad bacteria thrive off sugary processed foods and an acidic environment. They are able to form what's known as a biofilm and these can sometimes be indestructible for human antibiotics. So let me rewind to 2015. I was bedridden or on crutches for a year, with depleted muscle mass, chronic fatigue, and multiple gut issues. I do absolutely confer that Western medicine is imperative to wellness. However, my health was needing more than immune modulated medication. I threw myself into the research, digging deep into medical literature around the body's incredible ability to heal and the magnitude of gut health. I sought the help of many, many doctors and health practitioners, and slowly but surely began to unpack the extent of the severe problems originating in my gut. I had things like leaky gut syndrome, a common problem that's found when toxicity actually leaks back into the bloodstream instead of being excreted out of the colon, and this is because that there are permeation problems in the gut lining. I also had something called SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I had severe bacterial infections and viruses, and I permanently felt bloated, uncomfortable, and fatigued. I just want to add also that my diet up till this point had never been completely terrible. I grew up in a household where uh, we were generally quite healthy, but with that said, not healthy enough. Just the right amount of genetically modified foods, gluten, and a little bit of sugar here and there it can create the perfect store. I also learned some alarming facts that our delicate microbiome can change and alter itself on a daily basis. Not only does our diet change the microbiome for good or worse, but external stress negatively alters it. Exercise change, changes it positively, and probiotics can also have a positive impact. And also our emotions through epigenetics can change the microbiome, which has also been touched on today. I also learned from Dr. Tara Swart, who is a neuroscientist and former psychiatrist, that the stress hormone cortisol is actually able to be expelled from the body, travel through the air like a pheromone, and be absorbed by another person. This, may, this means that you may be doing an excellent job managing your own stress levels, 
But if you're operating in an environment that is toxic, your microbiome is changing because of the stress in the environment. I love the concept of bio-individuality. This means that we are each, um, sorry, bio-individuality means that if we each fully understood our unique microbiome, we would probably never again follow a one-size-fits-all diet. The concept of bio-individuality was really um, liberating for me. Each having our own set of bacteria, genetics, cell metabolism means that we all thrive on a unique diet. And that diet itself is, could be changing throughout your life, depending on whether you're in summer, winter, and different phases that you go through with your health. And I think our mind needs to become flexible to the fact that a diet that may suit you at age 30 may not serve you at age 14. I think an exciting part of each of our journeys is to actually be able to reconnect to that instinctive part that knows what is good for you and what is not good for you to eat. And tools like Biome are incredible to assist with that process. I experienced firsthand also the strong link between gut health and mental health. I suffered with really bad anxiety for many years. And interestingly enough, once I'd successfully combated my gut issues, I noticed a huge improvement in my anxiety levels. And where, where I used to think that I was just wired to always be anxious. And now that I've addressed these gut issues, um, the anxiety has subsided substantially. If we consider the physiology of the body, we can see that there is what is called a superhighway of communication. And that is occurring between the gut and the brain, along a nerve called the vagus nerve. Mostly the communication is unconscious, and predominantly the traffic is going from the gut up to the head brain. But because bacteria and viruses can attack the central nervous system and interfere with this communication via the vagus nerve, that can leave people very vulnerable to, back to mental health. A few instrumental changes that I implemented helped me get, get back onto my feet and be healthy again. I collaborated with some really brilliant functional medicine doctors. I adopted a pretty rigorous anti-inflammatory diet. This means that I focused mostly on fresh natural foods and I eliminated gluten, sugar, processed foods, and I steered clear of preservatives GMOs, additives, chemicals, and unnatural flavorings, which unfortunately are found in most everyday food. I went on some good, um, really high quality supplements. A lot of them I'm still on now as a maintenance. And also very importantly, I adopted um, mindfulness practice daily. I also changed the way I perceived and managed stress. I noticed and dealt with recurring negative emotions. I incorporated exercise that was suitable for me, not my partner, not my neighbor, but it's about tuning into what works for your body. And for me, it was gentle walk walking and stretching and toning. Have you noticed that everything I've mentioned is not just physical? Health is more than what you eat, although what you eat is completely imperative. According to an American leading stem cell biologist, Dr. Bruce Lipton, he says our thoughts and emotions are changing our gene expression. One simple and very cost effective, in the sense that it's free, way of managing emotions and stress is through mindfulness. And scientific evidence has said that just 10 minutes a day of mindfulness over a six week period can actually impact how the brain functions. In a positive way. It also calms the central nervous system and can, boost, and can boost the immune system. Health and wellness from an emotional, mental, and physical perspective for me is an ongoing journey of life. My curious mind will never switch off, and I'm still learning every day. My health is not perfect now, but where it was once very much a sinking ship, it is now strongly in the right direction. This experience of going through this health journey has really also defined and shaped my career in a completely different way that I could never have even made up in my mind. 
As a neuroscience-based life and health coach, I run re regular workshops um, where I can teach and share the essential information to people to empower them on how to manage their health. And the title of these workshops is The Neuroscience of the Mind-Gut Connection, because the gut is everything. If, I had to, if the value of money had to suddenly disappear tomorrow, I would still wake up and do this work every day. And I think how we connect our careers and our sense of purpose has a huge impact on mental health too, as that is how we are spending most of our time. Experiencing the Byron product firsthand last year was incredible for me. I truly believe that we are at the starting point of the future of medicine by using stool sample analysis. The convenience of having your gut health mapped out for you on your phone is incredible. A uniquely designed eating platform for you. Biome, I think, encourages individuality, ownership of health by the customer, and knowledge and understanding of their own microbiome. I know we have so many problems with technology, but when it is used in a really beneficial way like this, it's truly incredible. I look forward to seeing and look forward with interest to see where Byron will be in one year, five years, five years, or 10 years. And where will your health be by then? I would like to close the simple quote that I love that for me summarizes the crossroads that humanity is at at the moment. If the doctors of today cannot be the nutritionists of tomorrow, then the nutritionists of today will need to be the doctors of tomorrow. Thank you. It was. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your story. That was very interesting, um, very personal, and, and really very insightful. Thank you for that. So if anybody has any questions, please just type them in the box that has appeared on the right-hand side of your screen, um, and the different panelists will answer them. If, if you have a question for a specific panelist, you're welcome to say who it is for. Otherwise, if it's just a question in general, um, the Viom team will allocate it to somebody. I believe some questions um, have come through already. Um, I'm going to just open that up to the different speakers to answer those. I believe there's a question that's been assigned uh, to Rob, if you want to start by answering that. We can't hear you, Rob. Ah, thank you, Stephen. I was uh, I was apologizing for being a little bit, uh, and and actually that might be an understatement, pixelated. Um, but uh, the question for those who can't see it: When will the test update to more than just vegetarian or non-vegetarian? I'm a pescatarian, uh, for example, but no fish on my list because I said vegetarian. So that's a great question. Um, at this time, I don't have an exact date for when we'll have additional toggles, but the advice that I would give would be uh, the toggle for vegetarian is always available in the app, so you can turn it on or off instantly. And what that would afford you is you will then see all of the meat options. Um, there are plenty of fish and seafood options in there, and so you'll be able to see um, where those options stack up, meaning are they, uh, you know, a salmon, a superfood, halibut, all of these different types of fish, um, shrimp, crab, lobster, etc. Uh, I will warn you, some of those may, in fact, depending on your results, be on the avoid or minimize food lists, um, but that's how I would go about it. Uh, there's another question here, how often should you test your microbiome? So, Stephen, feel free to jump in here uh, if you uh, if I miss anything. But the way that we would think about it is do the test the first time and understand what's your baseline. What do my scores look like? How are my uh, food recommendations stacking up? And then follow those food recommendations for 
about eight to 12 weeks because eight to 12 weeks is about the period of time it takes your microbiome to adjust to a new diet or a new environment. Um, and then after that point at about the 12 week mark, you should retest. Uh, some of your foods will change, your scores will change. Um, beyond that point, then it becomes like going to the dentist. Once or twice a year, do a check-in, uh, maybe more frequently if, if there's some dramatic changes. So for instance, you move into another country, uh, you've been on antibiotics, or there's been some other dramatic change to your diet. Um, but after those first one or two tests, it's like going to the dentist. And actually in the app, it will prompt you. So as soon as you do your first test, you will begin getting notifications how long until uh, your 90 day window is up and you should do a retest. So it does, it does share that with you. Uh, okay, so here's another great question. So with respect to the general population that your score is measured against, is that filtered to match you by age, gender, uh, ethnicity, et cetera, or is it just compared to the general population? Oop, I got cut off there. I think that was the end of that. General population as a whole. Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, the cohorts, as we call them, which is how we design these score ranges, is uh, based on the exact same or utilizes the same process as a cohort for a, a regular lab test that you would get from your doctor. And so for that reason, it is uh, towards the general population uh, and, and not necessarily age specific or ethnicity specific um, for those scores. What I will say is for minors, uh, that's where age becomes a determining factor. So for instance, we have lots of people that have their, their children sequenced um, that two or eight or six year old is not going to be compared to the general population. Those scores are, are relevant or, or uh, relative to that age group uh, of minors, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, another you, great Rob. question here. Oh, sorry. No problem. Please continue. I wasn't sure if you were finished answering. You're welcome to continue. Oh yeah. Uh, if if there's additional, if I've missed something, feel free to to uh, chime in or cut me off. Um, so, do we need to cut out the foods we should avoid it entirely? Uh, for example, one of mine is coffee, and I need it <laughs> at least one cup in the morning. Uh, that is probably the most common question slash complaint we get related specifically to coffee. Uh, and it brings up a great point, which is how should you think about the avoid foods? Uh, and there's some some layers and some nuance to this. The As we were talking about earlier, the gut scores themselves, those 20 scores, that information is 100% from the sample that you collected. Uh, it includes no other information. The food recommendations are more like going to a doctor where it's a combination of, hey, we ran some tests, tell me how you're feeling, what have you been doing these days, and then let's put together a protocol on, on how to move forward. That's how, the food, how to think about the food recommendations. And so as it relates to something like coffee, that is likely to include what we would consider phenotypic data, meaning uh, how do you feel? Are you having uh, trouble sleeping? Um, are you having anxiety? Are you having acid reflux? Uh, those things will come into play with something like coffee. And so a good functional way to think about this, and this can be applied to most of the food recommendations, test it. Uh, do a little bit of a guess and check. Try cutting back on the coffee. If you're only doing one cup a day, uh, it becomes more binary. You're either drinking it or you're not. Um, but test that out for, for a week or two and see how the difference makes you feel um, related to some of those things that might have caused it to be on the avoid list, meaning sleep, anxiety, uh, acid reflux, et cetera. Um, and if you don't notice a difference, uh, it's probably okay to, to add it back in. But Stephen, you, you would be a better expert on that. Uh, anything to add? Oh, I'm answering questions by... Um by typing, so I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Am I supposed to answer questions by typing? I guess. Uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm getting questions sent to me somehow. So, so I agree. Hi, I, I agree. Hi, Stephen, we'd love it if you'd answer the questions so that everyone could hear the answers, please. Okay. So first, uh, in terms of what Rob, what Rob just said, um, uh, yes, and you know, it, it's a matter of using common sense um, with this with this approach as well. So Rob's example of the coffee is a good, is a good example. Um, if it's binary, then yes, avoiding it will be beneficial to you. If you normally drink four cups a day and bring it down to one cup a day will be beneficial uh, to you. So it was all gradients and there's no, there's no magic in it. Um, so, but the more compliance you have, then the, the better uh, general health effects you'll have because you're then manipulating um, the microbiome in a way that will help uh, the gene expression. So the more you can do, the better. I guess this is a simple answer. Um, I have one, Rob, can I switch to one question here? Uh, By all means. On this, okay. Um, somebody asked about um, uh, to what extent can managing one's microbiome help treat disease like Lyme disease? Um, and does getting one's microbiome into balance have any impact on resisting viruses like, like COVID-19? So to the extent that these conditions are related to either autoimmune diseases, you know, through molecular mimicry of perhaps bacteria that are in the microbiome um, or immune system dysfunction uh, in general, then yes, um, getting rid of that state of dysbiosis, getting your microbiome back in balance, getting the inflammatory pathways um, reduced, um, they will have an impact in them. Uh, as I think it was mentioned, you know, 80% of our immune system activity is actually uh, on the gut lining. So um, it's not just what's happening in our, in our, in our blood um, with our uh, lymphocytes and white blood cells, et cetera. It's actually happening uh, at that uh, barrier between the outside and the inside of, of the body. So the immune system is really important. Um, and the microbiome obviously is the key determinant of how that, how that immune system is functioning. In terms of the, of the current situation of COVID-19, um, again, if we imagine that having better health in general will allow us to either one, be more resistant to um, uh, symptoms developing for a, a virus like COVID, um, like SARS-CoV-2, um, or in fact, can it, um, uh, if you do have symptoms, can it lessen the symptoms? Um, then it makes sense that having the balanced microbiome will help with that. Rob, that, is, that is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation, um, Stephen. I believe um, Shelley is going to be answering some questions next. I just needed to unmute myself. Uh, the question I've got is how much does the test cost in South Africa? So we've actually got uh, two prices to the test. So for your first test that you do, it costs 3,990 Rand. In that is the collection kit, the courier of the kit, as well as courier of the sample over to the US for testing. Then for any subsequent tests that you do, uh, so repeat tests, the test will be costing 3,400 Rand. And yeah, that was my only question. Uh, I had another one over here, which we touched on a little bit. Uh, so what big events could influence the microbiome and require a test sooner uh, than usual? Um, so as uh, actually Sarah pointed out in, in her presentation, the numerous uh, environmental factors that can impact the system, I think for simplicity reasons, the easiest ones would be if your personal diet changes dramatically, meaning um, for whatever reason you decide to try the, the keto diet or a paleo diet or, or go raw vegan or, or something like that, um, that will have an impact over uh, on this system. And so retesting sooner in that case might make sense. Uh, of course, if you've been on antibiotics and have wiped out that system, it makes sense to retest maybe sooner rather than later. The one caveat I will make with that is uh, we, we do advise people to wait uh, at least a month, um, probably six weeks is better 
after antibiotics before testing because um, so much of that system gets wiped out. I've actually done this on myself. Uh, so much of that system gets wiped out during the course of antibiotics that um, the test will look much, it, it won't be a true representation of what's going on in your gut uh, more long term. Uh, and then the last thing I would add is if you've been traveling substantially over a period of time, uh, maybe retesting sooner rather than later would make sense because traveling uh, different time zones, obviously uh, different environmental factors and foods, if you're in different countries or different areas, will have an impact on that system. So those would probably be the basis uh, cases for, for retesting sooner. I have a question here. Can you hear me, Rob? Yes, I can hear you, Stephen. Okay. Uh, someone asks, uh, most of my superfoods aren't available in South Africa. What now? Um, well, the what, the what now is that we are working on something called localization, um, which includes many things for uh, different things for different countries, which includes in, in some countries, obviously translation into their native language. And it, of course, also includes some um, uh, foods. Um, uh, in terms of South Africa, um, we're probably working on localization in terms of Asian countries um, first, in, in terms of Japan and, uh, and China, because they have such a, a significant difference in, in food choices. Um, then uh, South America, uh, and then as we develop the, the, the ways to do this in the app, then South Africa um, would follow from, from that. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen and Rob. And I believe uh, we have our last question, which is for Sarah. Right. Sarah, are you ready to answer? Yes, I'm here. Um, so the question was, how accurate were the biome results compared to the research that I had done? And when I started doing the biome test, I had obviously done a lot of research and done a lot of work on my gut and it wasn't a good enough place, although not perfect at all. And to put it simply, the results did not surprise me, the biome results. The issues that I knew I had that were existing, like um, leaky gut, which tends to come back quite often, um, and inflammatory markers were definitely present in the biome results. And something else I found interesting was that about 10 years before, I had had blood tests done on specific foods that caused inflammation in my body. And this actually confirmed those foods. And some of them were so specific, like green peppers and onions and things like that. So there wasn't anything surprising, but it did, I did learn new information because I found the list of bacteria and the different scores and um, the number of breakdowns and all the different scores and um, I did definitely learn more about my gut through the testing, which was really exciting. It's incredible how this information has helped you so much, Sarah. Um, I believe there's one more question which has now come through for Rob. Ooh, let me reopen my questions here. <laughs> Just when you thought you were done. <laughs> Uh, and this is actually, I'm going to uh, require some assistance from Stephen as well, but when doing the test, should you stop taking all medications? Uh, I, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the uh, rule of thumb is if these are things you're taking on a regular basis, continue to take them, because um, you're especially if you plan on going back on them after taking the test, uh, you want to get an understanding of how your microbiome is functioning in its current environment. Um, the other thing too is it would probably take some time uh, off of those medications to make a difference. Um, and that's probably against doctor's orders would be my guess. Uh, Stephen, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, I, I agree, Rob. Uh, I guess, and the one thing, if someone uh, has just finished a course of antibiotics, then unless you wanna just see results that show how the antibiotics are wiped out your microbiome, um, you're best off waiting um, you know, three or four weeks until uh, doing the test to give your normal microbiome uh, a chance to start to be growing back and then you get an idea of what, what your normal one is.
Thank you for that explanation. Um, and one last question has just come through uh, for Shelley, which she's going to answer quickly. There we go. Um, so the question was whether this test is going to be covered by medical aid. So uh, currently it won't be. It will be something that we'll try and work towards, but uh, unfortunately at the moment it's not going to be covered. Uh, there was also just another question that came through about uh, the supplement recommendations. So the supplements uh, supplement section, you will see that the recommendations are um, have a link that goes towards Amazon in order to be able to purchase the supplements, which obviously is not available in South Africa. So on our side, we have worked out an alternative list of uh, medications which can be purchased in South Africa, and we will be able to tell clients that ask where they can find, uh, find them here. Great. Okay, well, I think um, that brings us uh, to the end of today's um, virtual launch. Thank you all um, for answering those questions so diligently. To any of the media or influencers, um, I know what happens after these things as you close your screen or you put down your laptop, you think, I should have answered, I should have asked that. What about this? So you're more than welcome um, to send those questions through to me and I will help um, get you the answer from the relevant speaker afterwards. So we'll be happy to answer any questions after the launch as well. And then really just another thank you uh, for making yourselves available for the time and for your attention um, during this time where we know that everybody's time is, is so precious. Um, really, thank you very much for joining us today. I will be sending out information to everybody and we look forward to working with all of you and helping you write your articles, your stories, your posts so that we can really take the message um, of this new healthcare option to, to all South Africans and, and thank you for helping us take it further and, and spread the news. So unless uh, there's anyone else, uh, thank you all very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Take good care, everybody. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.